So a few weeks ago, I made mention of the Chronicles of Narnia, and I'm sorry that I have to go back there again. But as I mentioned then, Aslan, the great lion, is one of the greatest depictions of Christ in fictional literature that you will ever encounter. And one of the things that really stood out to me this last time reading it was that every time he appears, the characters, both good and bad, are frightened of him, but with different reactions. The good characters are frightened, but not overwhelmed. They have a righteous fear. As they say, he's not a tame lion after all. But they have a pulling towards him. He is irresistible to them. And so they approach, aware that they are unworthy, but having a great need to be with him. Evil characters, on the other hand, run away as fast as they can. They see him, they recognize him, and they flee. And then there are few characters who refuse to open their eyes to him and so remain in the darkness. With Aslan, C.S. Lewis depicts in an alarming way how we respond to Christ to a certain extent in this life, but to a greater extent in the next life. Our first reading from Isaiah and our gospel reading today also demonstrate this for us, though in more real terms, encounters with God. Isaiah has a vision of God in heaven, with the angels praising him, singing the Sanctus as we do at every Mass. And what is Isaiah's reaction? He feels doomed because he is not worthy to see God or be in his presence. An angel cleanses him by touching his mouth with an ember. It is a symbolic cleansing of his sinful nature. This passage is an important analogy of the cleansing of purgatory. Many people have a difficult time with the idea of purgatory. They think of it as a punishment, and to a certain extent it is. But it is important to think of purgatory as a gift rather than a curse. As great theologians have pointed out, when we die and are presented in front of Christ, we will be stripped of the false clothes we have wrapped ourselves in, the excuses we make for our sinfulness. We will be ashamed of our sins and recognize our unworthiness in the presence of God, just like Isaiah. We will have a taste of the perfect, but fully aware of our imperfection. We will grieve that we will never be able to achieve eternal perfection. And this is where the gift of purgatory comes in. Without it, the only possible eternal landing spots would be heaven or hell. And since we won't be perfect when we die, heaven would be an impossibility. Yet, Christ died for us. Christ died and rose again so that we can have a chance to reach eternal happiness. Since heaven is a possibility, we have to have a way of reaching that perfection. And the only way is to be purged of our sins. And so purgatory is a gift because it is a cleansing of our sins so that we can make it to heaven. Without purgatory, we essentially would be all be eternally doomed. But this is how much God loves us. And we also have the story of Simon Peter and Christ in the gospel today. Christ enters the fishing boats and tells them to go out to fish. When they lower their nets, they are astounded to find that their nets have been filled to overflowing. Simon immediately understands who Christ is. He falls to his knees and sorrowfully says, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I am sure that many of us have encountered something similar. We are abundantly blessed by God. We are overwhelmed by his love for us. And we then reflect on, on our unworthiness. And we feel that we cannot be in his presence or we need to do something to make up for it. This is another gift, a recognition of reality. It should lead to another gift poured out to us from the cross, the gift of the sacrament of penance, where we can rid ourselves of our unworthiness here on earth. My most profound moment like this came at a retreat. So where I went for undergraduate studies, Texas A&M, has an amazing retreat called Aggie Awakening. 
It's a Friday to Sunday retreat for college students that, at least when I was there, always had a waiting line of at least 100 people. I didn't have any interest in going while I was there, but the summer after I graduated, a friend of mine from a different university with a similar retreat convinced me to go. And while at the time I was fairly lukewarm in my faith, I decided to go with an intentionally open heart. And I've always called it the most important weekend of my life. What started out as a great weekend of meeting my fellow Aggies and learning about my faith on Sunday turned into an intense emotional experience where I truly felt the love of God and the power of the body of Christ. It was the weekend where I finally took my faith seriously as an adult. It was when I started attending Mass, not just because it was an obligation, but because I wanted to. Now, by no means have I been perfect since, and the seminary was still many years away. But it was a profound experience of recognizing the many gifts that God has given me. I honestly pray that if you have not an experience have not had an experience like this already, you will. Our faith is so dependent on having a personal encounter with Christ. Without that encounter, I doubt that anyone can truly be invested in their faith. But with a similar encounter, I don't know how anyone could ever leave. The thing is, God wants to have a personal encounter with you. He wants to share himself with you in an intimate way. We have to have the right disposition to accept it. Anytime I might think that I wish I had gone in that retreat earlier, I realize that if I had gone earlier, I would not have been in the right place mentally to accept it. It was all in God's time, perfect time. And think about the result of these encounters in our readings. Simon and James and John, when they reach the shore, leave everything and follow Christ. Isaiah, when the Lord asks whom he can send, responds, Here I am, send me. This is the natural response of the divine loving encounter. We cannot help but become disciples. This is our calling. I've been saying it. The bishop has been saying it. Our upcoming annual Catholic appeal will remind us of it. We are called to be disciples of Christ. We are called to take what we have received here and bring it out to the rest of the world. If we never talk about our faith outside of church, if we never seek to learn more about our faith, if we never build up our relationship with God through prayer, then we are not fulfilling our calling from God. We don't have to do anything big and dramatic. We don't have to sell our fishing boats and become the first pope. But we do have to do our part to change our world in little ways to make it more like the kingdom of heaven. And this is our challenge. And it comes from God himself. Do not be afraid. Take a chance on God. Accept the gifts of repentance and cleansing that he offers us. Become true disciples of Christ and sing praises to the Lord in the sight of the angels.